That feeling when one is between books can be the most delightful of all. It's a state of infinite potential, like being suspended in orbit above some unknown planet. For me, the end of the year offers a certain space to savor that experience. So right now it's December 25th, it's Christmas morning and I'm in Warsaw. Uh, and really in, in Poland, Christmas is celebrated on Christmas Eve, the Vigilia feast. So most Poles are likely sleeping off last night's excesses. And I, I have Runek Nowego Miasta uh, pretty much to myself. Um, and I also have a bit of time off work, so I thought it would be a nice moment to begin uh, another reading diary and let you know what I find myself reading over this period. In about a week's time, I'm going to be heading to Paris for several days. So I found myself in the mood to read some French writers and in, in truth, uh, I've never really dedicated that much attention to French literature. Of course, I've read uh, many French writers, uh, Flaubert, Rimbaud, uh, Camus, uh, Zola, and, and so on. But I've never really given it the same kind of attention that I've given to German or Polish or even Japanese literature, so I thought it would be exciting to discover some things that were new to me. I adore the spacious liminality of the time between Christmas Day and the end of the year. Time torn off and deliciously unused. I do spend some of this time, in any case, looking for interesting French writers to read. In particular, I really wanted to find some French horror, and uh, as it turns out, it's not that easy to do. At least for me it wasn't, um, looking for French horror writing in, in translation. But after a little bit of research, I stumbled upon the name Claude Seignol, who seemed to represent just what I was looking for. Uh, he's a writer of weird tales um, that draw on a really rich tradition of French rural folklore. So I just had to check it out. In addition to being a writer of fiction, Claude Seignol was also a respected folklorist. In 1937, he published, along with his brother Jacques, the well-received book Le Folklore du Urepois, and in the 1990s, a four-volume collection of regional folk tales from all over France. He's also published work on the figure of the devil in the popular tradition. But I was most curious about the way he would channel this knowledge of folklore into fiction. I'm currently about halfway through the first novella in a collection of two novellas, and the, the publication is The Accursed. Uh, it contains Malvenu and Marie the Wolf, um, and I'm really intrigued by it so far. I'm enjoying it tremendously. It's, it's really well written, and uh, it's a kind of slow burn folk horror, um, which is something I absolutely love. It's set in a rural community and, and focuses on uh, one particular farmstead and its land. Um, 
and its chapters alternate between two successive generations on the, on the same land. The story centers around the figure of a young daughter of a Breton farmer. Her nickname in the village is Malvenu, a name which, as I understand it, carries connotations something like bad seed or of ill origin. The story progresses as a kind of unearthing, both literal and metaphorical, of the origins of her own destructive impulses, which are intimately entwined with a buried statue in a patch of land which has lain uncultivated for centuries. I really love its emphasis on the land itself, uh, its, its focus on labour and toil and uh, sort of unforgiving nature of the landscape that surrounds this community. Indeed, the opening begins with the whole village asleep in their beds. Each person slept the same deep, laborious sleep, their muscles still preserving the rhythm of the day's work and sometimes harvesting in the void. The women moaned with exhaustion. They felt a twisting in their loins, as if they still really were hoisting up the loathsome swaths bristling with hostile thistles. It strikes me that there are certain similarities to M.R. James, which is really not what I was expecting when I picked up this book. Uh, I mean, not in terms of its characters. There are certainly no sort of bumbling academics uh, in the picture. But uh, there is an emphasis on local history, and there's also uh, an artifact of somewhat sinister provenance uh, at the center of the narrative, which is something that M.R. James often does. Um, and in particular, the sort of, there's a patch of, of land that um, mustn't be disturbed, that is considered to be cursed, that really reminded me of The Rose Garden, which is one of my favorites of M.R. James's tales. The motif of bad land is a familiar one, but its very effective evocation in this book not only draws on the idea of folk memory or communal memory, the ways in which it is embedded in the landscape, but also announces one of the book's central concerns, the necessity of a reverent stewardship of the land and a condemnation of its unrestricted commodification. There have been moments in the, in the book that have been really chilling, actually. Um, one particular episode involving the, the attempted capture of, uh, of a hare in this cursed field. Um, and it features a hideous, sort of horrific description of the hare at close quarters. I found it tremendously effective. The hare had shown his face, and the face was frightful. The eye sockets were empty, deep and bloody. The nostrils were gaping open to the bone. The lips moved in a slimy putrescence. Only the teeth retained some semblance of life. But the girl could see at once that there was no tongue. The skin on the head was dangling in decay. But what appalled her most was that the dead head was resting on a living, healthy body, plump, sleek of fur and fleet of foot. There's just something sinister about hares in general, isn't there? Um, I'll have to investigate that. As it turned out, this investigation conducted itself for me, as it were, at least partially. This week I'm reading Ian Duig's poem, The Lamas Hireling, with my students. It tells of a young farmhand and warlock who transforms by night into a hare. Then one night, disturbed from dreams of my dear late wife, I hunted down her torn voice to his pale form, stock still in the lights from the dark lantern, stark naked but for the fox trap biting his ankle, I knew him a warlock, a cow with leather horns. To go into the hare gets you muckled sorrow, the wisdom runs, muckled care. I leveled and blew the small owl through his heart. The moon came out. By its yellow witness, I saw him fur over like a stone muslin. His lovely head thinned, his top lip gathered, his eyes rose like bread. A 
According to an article I read while researching the poem, The Witch as Hair, or The Witch's Hair, this was a widely held superstition in the Nordic tradition, but also across the British Isles. Witches would take the shape of the hair in order to steal milk from cattle. So it's a couple of days after Christmas and uh, I thought I'd head out for a little walk. I remembered that while I was Christmas shopping I saw a book or two that piqued my interest and uh, didn't pick them up so I thought I'll go and check and see if they're still around. I take a little walk to the catchily named Główna Księgarnia Naukowa imienia Bolesława Prusa, where you can find a fair selection of books in English. Later, on the way home, the sun sets early, the streets fill up, and the air comes alive with the smoky aroma of fried ostsepek, the sweetness of hot, sugar-coated nuts and glühwein. So I was really thrilled to see that uh, Nadezhda Mandelstam's memoir, Hope Against Hope, has uh, been released in this uh, Everyman's Library edition. I, I really love these, these beautifully made hardbacks. Um, I've got quite a lot of them, and yeah, they're just wonderful quality, I think. Um, but I'd wanted to, to read this uh, ever since I read Ossip Mandelstam's poetry um, and at the end of the collection that I have there's, uh, there's a letter from Nadezhda Mandelstam written to uh, her husband. It's the last letter written by her and uh, she doesn't know whether he's alive or dead at that point. Um, he's been sent off to uh, a labour camp uh, and yeah, I thought it was really beautiful, particularly this passage. This is from the 22nd of October, 1938. She writes, Osha, what a joy it was living together like children. All our squabbles and arguments, the games we played, and our love. Now I do not even look at the sky. If I see a cloud, who can I show it to? Yeah, and I also thought I'd pick up this uh, collection um, of essays or vignettes. I think they're called Chronicas uh, by Clarisse Lispector. Um, they're published between 1967 and 1977, um, and they seem to be really wide-ranging. I, I picked these up because I've, I've just recently ordered pretty much all of uh, Clarice Lispector's work. She's someone whom I want to explore uh, much more fully in the coming year. So, yeah, I thought it would be a nice thing to pick up. So I finished Malvenu, the first novella in the collection, The Accursed, and uh, surprisingly in, in the second half um, it really loses some of that patience I was, I was talking about and uh, the pace really picks up, uh, it fully embraces its supernatural character and becomes quite insane. There are uh, psychedelic dream visions, there are uh, lakes and marshes erupting with diabolical force and uh, floating heads in mists of blood. Um, it really takes it up to 11. I confess that it lost a little bit of its charm for me. Uh, I mean, I'm a reader who really enjoys sort of slow burn, atmospheric horror, and I really value that, that patience in a writer. Um, but despite that, there was still some really arresting imagery, um, particularly around the transfiguration of uh, stone into flesh and flesh into stone that carries this 
quite disturbing, almost erotic character to it. And I did really enjoy its emphasis on generational trauma, uh, inherited grief and the burden of the land. This embedded notion of a necessary respect for the land that's learned with difficulty by those who want to exploit it. I also finished the second novella, Marie the Wolf, um, which shares quite a lot in common with Malvenu, actually. Uh, it's also um, set at the end of the 19th century, as uh, Malvenu partially is, and uh, at its centre it has a sort of persecuted heroine whose uh, sexuality and desirability gets bound up with uh, supernatural forces. And uh, it also f seemed to function as a sort of critique of the class structure. Um, at its core is this sort of ill-fated match between uh, the son of a landowner and the daughter of a tenant farmer. Um, and mm, given that it's something of a taboo, it allows for uh, rumours and superstitions about witchcraft and devilry to really run wild. I enjoyed this second novella, uh, but slightly less than Malvenu, um, which really had powerful moments for me. And uh, I find myself still intrigued to explore Claude Seigneur's work a little bit further. So if any of you um, have read him before and, or think there's something that's really worth exploring, just let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll try to check it out. So I think I'm going to turn away from French horror for a little while. Uh, I think perhaps I've had my fill for now. And uh, find something maybe a little bit more experimental in nature. Um, so I'm going to raid my home library and uh, also perhaps have a look in some bookshops, see if I can pick something exciting up. I make my way to the delightful little bookshop in Stare Miasto, in the Historia. I find myself heading there pretty often. While I don't find anything in French that intrigues me, I'm very excited to find a copy of Stanisław Wyspiański's play, The Wedding, or Wesela, which I didn't know had been translated. Wyspiański is an artist and playwright and a central figure in the Young Poland or Młoda Polska movement. I have friends who adore the play and have encouraged me to read it, so I'm very keen to do so. It's hugely important culturally here in Poland. It's a set text in school, and there's also been a film adaptation by Andrzej Wajda, one of Poland's most celebrated directors. I promise my Polish friends I'll get to it soon. For now, though, I'm going to stick with the French for a little while. So it's the last day before I head to Paris. I'm going really early in the morning tomorrow, and I'm just out sorting out a few last minute things. I thought I'd check in with you briefly. So I decided, after all, to pick up something that had been in my collection for quite a while. Uh, I got it as a present a few years ago, uh, and that's The Great Fire of London, a story with interpolations and bifurcations by Jacques Roubaud. Um, and I'm about 100 pages in uh, at the moment, which is a difficult thing to count in this book because uh, because of its strange organization. Uh, it's organized in three sections with a sort of main narrative and then these separate sections that function like footnote, footnotes that uh, interrupt the text from time to time, the interpolations and bifurcations. Jacques Roubaud is a poet, novelist and mathematician born in 1932. He's a member of Ulipo, 
a group of writers and mathematicians whose aim is to extend the formal and stylistic boundaries of literature through the imposition of various linguistic and compositional constraints. Oulipo, for anyone who doesn't know, stands for Ouvroir de Littérature Potentielle, or Workshop of Potential Literature, and its members have included such famous figures as Georges Perec and Raymond Queneau. It's quite a challenging book to read. It, it poses not only uh, intellectual and conceptual challenges, but also physical ones. Uh, it requires the reader to have three separate bookmarks on the go at any one time uh, because of how often you flip back and forth between the, the sections. Um, and this is less irritating than it might sound. It's actually a lot of fun and it's part of the book's sort of playful nature. Uh, Jacques Roubault is, is quite preoccupied with the um, the relationship between the reader and the writer, the uh, separate spaces that they occupy, um, and the book is, yeah, quite self-consciously a written document. The Great Fire of London, translated by Dominic Di Bernardi and published by Dorky Archive Press, is unabashedly experimental and is comprised of interrelated numbered sections or moments that vary considerably in their concerns but manage to feel cohesive. It's an odd mix of autobiographical writing, essayistic vignettes, memories, as well as an account of the composition of the book itself and notes towards something Roubaud calls the project, a broader work of poetry and mathematics whose byproduct, or perhaps even symptom, is the Great Fire of London itself, the text we find ourselves reading. One Olympian constraint imposed upon the text, though it's suggested that there are many more working on deeper levels, is that Roubaud would write in the hours of pre-dawn darkness in his apartment on Rue de Franck Bourgeois, an unedited flow of words produced until the light began to flood through the blinds, forcing him to stop. What I find wonderful about the effects of this constraint is the sense that the book is a living document. It's a kind of sentient text in the process of its own unfolding self-discovery. What we observe as readers is the meandering journey as it takes shape. Stylistically, the book is also uh, extraordinarily varied and, and tonally too, so it ranges from this a uh, hyper-intellectual, almost pedantic tone. And you might have uh, Roubaud spending 10 pages or so on uh, medieval, ob obscure medieval Spanish verse forms or something like that. Uh, and then it will suddenly become very tender, uh, melancho melancholic and, uh, and highly personal, this sort of unflinching honesty. And that's one of the incredible things about this book for me so far, is that uh, amid all these uh, playful, uh, experimental, structural games that the, the book is playing, there's uh, a very genuine sense of grief as the, the book is written in, in the wake of uh, Roubaud's wife's death. Uh, his wife died very young at the age of 31 from uh, a pulmonary embolism. Uh, and she was an artist herself, she was a photographer. Alex Clio Roubaud was a Canadian photographer born in Mexico. She had moved to France in order to receive treatment for her severe asthma. She and Jacques were married in 1980. Their three short years together were captured by her in a series of intimate black and white photographs. In The Great Fire of London, Roubaud says that of all the reasons to write the book, love for Alex was its overriding purpose. So I'm having a huge amount of fun with the book. I'm enjoying it tremendously. Um, but I find that it requires quite a lot of focus and attention, so, uh, I'm reading it quite slowly. In any case, uh, I hope to catch up with you again about it when I get to Paris. 
and perhaps even uh, visit some of the places that are central to the book itself. I have to wake up at 4 a.m. to catch my flight. Not an easy thing to do on New Year's Day. I arrive in Paris somewhat sleep deprived, pursued by the rain clouds that will be my intermittent companions throughout the trip, though I'm soon reinvigorated by the city's grandeur. So I made it to Paris. Uh, I've been here just over a day and uh, the weather's been so terrible, it's been quite difficult to find a moment and uh, a spot to sit down and talk to you. But right now, uh, it's early afternoon. I'm, I'm in Jardin des Plantes and I thought it'd be a nice moment to catch up. So I have had a bit of time to uh, read some more of Jacques Roubault's The Great Fire of London, which I'm still enjoying immensely. And uh, I've just finished the chapter entitled A Portrait of the Absent Artist, which is a sort of catalogue of his uh, appearance and his, his habits. And there are four qualities that he focuses on in particular. Uh, his life as a walker, uh, as a swimmer, as a mathematician or counter, as he puts it, and, uh, and finally his, his life as a reader. And they're quite kind of joyous celebrations of those activities. Um, but the chapter that follows them mm, remarks on the sort of ghostly quality that binds all those activities, which is uh, solitude. Uh, and there's yeah, an extraordinary sort of mm, descent in, in mood at that point because Jacques Roubault talks about how uh, he had reveled in solitude throughout most of his life um, but when uh, his, his partner, his wife Alex passed away uh, that quality of solitude has become a kind of consequence of, uh, of his life experience, a kind of brutal consequence and when it's enforced, it becomes something uh, almost unbearable. It's another instance of this sort of threading of grief throughout the text, uh, most of which is consigned to the bifurcations, the, the very last section of the book. And there's a sense that, uh, that I got anyway, that it, it feels as though uh, that subject, that topic has been kind of mm, repressed somewhat. Uh, sort of hidden away at the back of the book as though uh, Roubault only confronts it with a certain amount of struggle or pain. Uh, but it's also mm, the part of the book where a lot of the most wonderful lyrical passages are, are contained. There's a particularly remarkable section in the bifurcations, uh, which is a discussion of one of Alex's photographs. It's a photograph of some trees taken at night, uh, a row of cypresses. Um, and it's a very long exposure, something like 15 minute exposure. And so these cypresses are a kind of ghostly black uh, spectral form against another shade of black. Um, it's a very evocative photograph in its own right, but when Roubault describes it, he talks about it as though it's a, a portrait of Alex's breath. The photograph comes from a series called 15 minutes la nuit au rythme de la respiration, or 15 minutes at night to a respiratory rhythm. The black and white image depicts a row of cypresses. Jacques Roubault recounts a hot August night in Provence, 1980. The star-filled air, the vines, the olive trees etched in black and dusty white, the breathing night and its fragrant heat, and the cypresses themselves climbing skyward like columns of black burning air. 
He remembers how, in the moonless but starry night, the idea occurred to Alex of photographing the night, of capturing upon the black and white page the weight of this slowness, of this archaic light coming down from the outermost reaches. It's a photograph of the naked night, shot naked in the night, the camera held against her bare-skinned chest, flush against her chest, naked. The long exposure lends the image a spectral impermanence, the hard edges of reality rendered indistinct. The rising and falling of Alex's chest is captured in the haze of these ghostly forms. Hubo says that the picture inherits her breath. The photograph is an unhappy and impassioned homage to respiration, breath, which its author, an asthmatic from birth, a condition that would eventually kill her, found and inscribed within the picture image, within the ink of these black candles, whose shapes so sharp, so autonomous in the world's dark night, airily dissipated upon the picture's pain, as if misted over. Another thing I really admire about the, the book is the way in which it manages to feel both structureless and highly structured at the same time. It's not a combination that I've come across very often in literature. Um, and uh, Poubo has commented many times uh, so far in the book that it is um, very detailed in its organisation, that there are uh, Olympian uh, constraints in place, quite a number of them by the sounds of it, uh, that there is... Um, very intricate planning of the numbering conventions of the chapters, for instance, uh, based on certain arcane uh, mathematical principles, uh, which are lost on me, unfortunately, I'll be honest. Um, but yeah, it feels almost like uh, a really sophisticated solo over a, a, a highly complex jazz chord progression. Uh, the sort of literary equivalent of soloing over giant steps or something like that. Um, yeah, it really is quite remarkable. The symbolist painter Gustave Moreau lived at number 14 on Rue de la Rochefoucauld. Towards the end of his life, he began to inventory his artworks, turning his home over to his legacy a museum that would commemorate his life's work. The house is overflowing with art, sumptuously encrusting every surface, projections of the painter's kaleidoscopic dreams. Strangely, one of the most striking is an unfinished piece, the chimeras, whose fractured, half-completed state conjures a strange paradoxical impression, a kind of orgiastic silence. I visit the jazz club Bezé Salé to watch the guitarist Mahan Mirarab and the singer Tara Merad, two wonderful musicians from Iran. One of the necks on Mirarab's guitar is fretless, allowing him to access microtonal scales reminiscent of the Persian oud. It's wonderful to watch him play. So I'd planned originally to visit Centre Pompidou, where, as I understand it, quite a number of Alex Cleo Rubo's photographs are housed. But I wrote to them and it turns out that the particular photograph I wanted to see is no longer on display. And so instead I'm gonna go and see if I can find the building in which uh, the Great Fire of London was composed. In the Gallimard bookshop, I find a huge book collecting all the important literary addresses in Paris. Under the name Jacques Roubault is an entry for Rue d'Amsterdam, 
but I'm looking for another. So I'm currently standing outside number 51, Rue des Francs Bourgeois, which is the building in which much of the Great Fire of London was composed in the early hours of the morning in pre-dawn darkness under lamplight. And it's quite poignant being here, knowing that uh, Robot insisted that to write down a memory was in some way to erase that memory. And knowing at the same time that Roubaix was forced to leave this place in order to escape the emptiness left behind after Alex's untimely death. Of this address, Roubaix writes, I'm going to leave this place. I have no life here. Time is suspended. The destroyed black lines, the incinerated time, black, silent and empty of my bereavement in this place where nothing has moved for 33 months, held and bound me, abolished all movement. I go from one writer's home to another. In the 17th century square, Place de Vosges, in the Marais district, is the former home of that giant of 19th century French literature, Victor Hugo. He had lived there in the 1930s and 40s, the temporary exhibition is dedicated to the life and work of Victor Hugo's grandson, Georges Hugo, whose admiration for his grandfather shaped his artistic pursuits and his character. As someone with less of a taste for 19th century realism, I occasionally find myself avoiding those particularly towering novelists of that century. But I leave the museum quite enthused, resolving to read something by Hugo very soon. So it's my last full day in Paris today. It's a, it's a Friday and last night I finally finished the Great Fire of London and uh, I'm just blown away by it truly. Uh, it strikes me as an absolutely monumental achievement. And I'm also surprised that uh, people don't seem to talk about Jacques Roubaud uh, very much. And, and I've even been in quite a few bookshops in Paris uh, during my trip, and uh, I've, I'm yet to see a single copy of any of his books anywhere. Uh, perhaps I'm not looking in the right places, but uh, it seems a shame to have such a wonderful, accomplished writer and not to celebrate him. I have to talk a little bit about the fifth chapter of the book, which is also the longest. It's called Dream Decision Project, uh, and it has a peculiar mix of almost mystical thinking uh, combined with, well, systematic or, or theoretical thinking. I call, it, I call it mystical because uh, it's essentially comprised of an, of an attempt to fashion from a dream that uh, Jacques Roubaud had in 1961, this highly complex architecture, this kind of crystalline dome in air uh, that would describe uh, a never-to-be-realized project out of which this book that we're reading is the kind of outgrowth. And so you have this highly detailed framework that underlies the proposed shape of the project and it takes the form of 99 theses or assertions as Jacques Roubaud will call them. It's wildly ambitious. And this ambition is embedded in the structure of the chapter. The theses themselves are organized according to a palindromic model, mirroring one another in an infinitely ramifying series. And this too is one of Roubaud's goals, to create what he thinks of as an infinite prose, an infinite novel. For me, this is the book's paradox, that its intricate planning, its almost fastidious organization, can be coupled with a narrative mode that embraces freedom, 
and which observes in infinitesimal detail the process of its own creation. What emerges is a book that precludes stasis. It becomes a living, protean thing, constantly undergoing a kind of fecund proliferation, an endless flowering that continually denies itself a final shape. Surprisingly, what I'm left with after reading the book, uh, along with quite a few questions and a bit of head scratching, uh, is an admiration for the book's profound humanity. Uh, there's a really strong sense that these intellectual, mathematical and literary games are not played simply for their own sake, but that they're deeply intertwined with the, the process of overcoming grief, that there's a, a catharsis of sorts that has been undergone. And that's quite, a, that's quite an amazing thing, I think, to be left with both a, an intellectual thrill, but also a very genuine emotional response. It doesn't happen too often, I think. So I have one more night in Paris and uh, I think I'm going to take the night off reading because I'm heading to a concert this evening. But that gives me a bit of time to decide what to read next and I think I'll go with one more French thing to make it a hat-trick and I'll let you know what I choose. In the Syriac Catholic Church, Saint Ephraim, by candlelight, I watch a performance of a Brahms cello sonata by the young and tremendously expressive cellist Krzysztof Michalski, which unfortunately I can't show you here, but it made the last night of my trip wonderfully memorable. I think a trip to Paris wouldn't be complete without a little visit to Shakespeare and company, so let's head over there and see what I can pick up. I'll let you know what I picked up there when I get home. I have a hard time falling in love with capital cities. I spent my entire life living in them. They can be harsh, stubborn in opening up their petals. But one thing is certain, Paris isn't shy about being a city for lovers of literature. Bookshops are to be found on every corner it really puts London and Warsaw to shame in that regard, and that's enough to melt my heart just a bit and indulge in some of that begrudging admiration that an Englishman can occasionally have for the French. I like Paris, I like sushi. Sushi. Sushi? Yeah. Good sushi in Paris? Sushi, I, life is good. Perfect. <laughs> Take care, man. <laughs> So I wanted to let you know what I picked up in Shakespeare and Company while I was there. Uh, it's been around 12 or 13 years since I was there last. And uh, this time I found myself slightly underwhelmed by, by their collection. Um, you know, it just struck me that for, for a bookshop with a certain avant-garde uh, pedigree, um, their collection is relatively unadventurous, uh, let's say, um, yeah, and, and largely quite, quite mainstream. Um, but, but nevertheless, I found some things that were of interest to me, so I'll just share them with you. Firstly, uh, inspired by my recent foray into Ulipian territory, I, I picked up uh, Kennel's Zazi in the Metro, um, which is supposed to be uh, wonderfully exuberant in in linguistic terms and contain lots of wordplay and uh, obscure slang and so on. So I'm I'm quite excited about that one. Um, I picked up "Big Breasts and Wide Hips" by Mo Yan, um, largely because uh, it struck me that I haven't really explored Chinese fiction at all, uh, other than um, a sort of anthology of. Chinese science fiction um, and so I was very curious to do that and uh, I've been intrigued for a, quite a long time by Mo Yan so uh, I hope to try that soon. Um, I heard wonderful things about uh, 
this book, Tomb of Sand, by Gitanjali Sri from uh, Sean uh, on his YouTube channel, Travel Through Stories. Um, so, uh, yeah, this was it was quite a buzz around this book last year. So I'm, I'm intrigued by it. Uh, and finally, um, Foucault's Pendulum uh, by Umberto Eco, uh, which I understand is quite a challenging and, and complex book, um, but is also supposed to be quite an adventure and a bit of a, a romp. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to read this one sooner rather than later, because this is uh, very high up on my list. So, yeah, I, I picked up a bit of non-fiction as well, but uh, I'll leave it there for now. So, some good stuff, I think. So I'm back in Poland now. I've been back about a week and uh, I'm back at work and so on. But I thought I'd add this little coda to my reading diary and let you know that um, on the plane on the way back from France, well, largely on the plane, I finished uh, Georges Bataille's Story of the Eye, which is a remarkable little book, I think. Um, I found it as engaging as I did perplexing. It's, uh, I suppose, a classic of erotic and transgressive literature. Um, and that, that phrase, to me, always seems like a little bit of a contradiction in terms. It's always slightly odd when a, a book that is dealing with uh, shocking subject matter or um, extremes of morality uh, eventually becomes absorbed into the canon. Uh, but this is a book that I think still has the power to shock. Um, it contains scenes of quite horrific uh, defilement, mutilation, uh, extreme sexual acts, uh, exhibitionism and, and so on. Um, and uh, coupled with this, there's a certain matter of factness to the to the style um, that uh, narrates these um, extreme acts um, with a, a certain simplicity um, although there are there are times when the language um, soars to quite lyrical heights the after image of the narrator's excesses at one point becomes projected onto the firmament I stretched out in the grass, my skull on a large flat rock, and my eyes staring straight up at the Milky Way, that strange breach of astral sperm and heavenly urine across the cranial vault formed by the ring of constellations. That open crack at the summit of the sky, apparently made of ammoniacal vapors shining in the immensity in empty space where they burst forth absurdly like a rooster's crow in total silence. A broken egg, a broken eye, or my own dazzled skull weighing down the rock, bouncing symmetrical images back into infinity. The book becomes particularly fascinating, I think, in the, in the context of Bataille's closing remarks in, in the book. Um, and the aim of these remarks seems to be largely to elucidate some of the sources of um, the symbolism within the, the narrative um, and, and also to give a certain insight into the operations or uh, sub subconscious processes of the er erotic imagination. Uh, and the sources for, uh, for the book seem to be largely autobiographical according to Bataille. So he, he details um, his experiences as a young person uh, dealing with a very, very sick father um, and often helping him or having to help him to, to urinate and so on. Um, he recounts an incident when he experienced um, a degree of terminal fear um, after a, a prank played upon him by his, his older brother. And both of these mm, well, incidents or, or conditions uh, become transfigured into the central 
symbols uh, of, of the book. Indeed, various forms of transfiguration are perhaps a central concern of Bataille's in the book. In the essay by Roland Barthes, Metaphor of the Eye, which is included in my edition, the story is read exclusively in terms of a single image or object that recurs in various forms, each time slightly transfigured. The egg, the sun, testicles, the eye are all versions of the same fetishized object, an object in which is distilled all the extremes of human lust, transgression, but also transcendence. I was left thinking by um, what was really an aside in Susan Sontag's pornographic imagination, which is an, an essay also included in, in this edition that I've got, um, about the degree to which transgression itself represents um, a form of escape by stepping outside of um, societal strictures, or um, if it in, in fact, or, or if in fact the expression uh, of, of certain inescapable impulses and drives in fact represents a, a greater unfreedom. And it seems to me that the book's action takes place on the border between these two impulses somehow. The book's final act takes place in Spain, um, in Seville more specifically, and uh, the sort of culminatory act of transgression takes place in uh, within a chapel. Um, and I was particularly struck struck by this, not only because of the shocking content of that scene, but also because of its setting. Um, it was remarkably similar to a chapel I found myself in when I was making my Andalusian uh, reading diary. Uh, I was on the trail of a, of a painting by Juan de Valdez Leal, which had so fascinated Lorca, um, and found myself um, in a chapel that is remarkably similar to the one described in Bataille's book. The chapel inside Hospital de la Caridad contains two paintings facing each other by Juan de Valdez Leal, just as described in the book, each showing the slow decomposition of the flesh, worms laying waste to the body. So I think I'm going to end my reading diary there, but uh, before I go I thought I'd just let you know that so far I've kept my promise to finally read some Victor Hugo um, and I'm currently about 400 pages into the wonderfully panoramic Les Miserables. Um, and overall it's about 1400 pages or just over that. So I'll likely need um, a bit of encouragement to, to finish it. Uh, in the comments, let me know who some of your favorite French writers are. I'd love to continue exploring. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing to the channel or sharing it somewhere online. It always really helps when you do that. Thanks ever so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.